All right. So thank you. Uh, throughout my career, I've studied how neurons change the strength of their synaptic connections and store memories. But did you know that only 15% of the cells in your head are neurons? What about the other 85%? What do they do? Well, those cells are called glia, and the word means glue. And that's essentially how they've been regarded for the last 100 years, as support cells for the electric neurons. Glia don't fire electrical impulses. But in recent years, scientists have determined that these glial cells do far more than anyone ever imagined. They're vital to every aspect of brain function in health and disease, and they're overturning our fundamental assumptions of how the brain works. So this is what I call the other brain, and it's an exciting uh, new frontier of brain science that's just now beginning to be explored. But first, let's <laughs> trace back to the roots of the story and ask, how did neuroscientists overlook half the brain till now? So this is the object of our fascination. You know, all of our emotions, our intellect, creativity, language, uh, memory, our personality, everything comes from this bodily organ, two and a half pounds of flesh that can think. Yet to look at it, there isn't a clue how it does any of those things. It, it might as well be two and a half pounds of tofu. You know, and that's because the working parts of the brain are so miniaturized, they're invisible. Now we're so accustomed to the electric circuit analogy of how the brain works, that it's difficult for us to think that it could work in any other way. Yet it might. Our fundamental idea about how the brain works hasn't changed in 100 years. So um, the neuron doctrine was is the basis for all our understanding of, of nervous system function, and it derives from Ramon y Cajal, the great uh, neuroanatomist of the 19th century. And he determined that neurons were separate and that information and communication in the brain takes place by electrical information passing through neurons in one direction and neurons communicating across synapses. In recent years, neuroscientists have come to realize that this fundamental assumption is not entirely correct. So it's very exciting. We, these pivotal points in science are the lore of scientific history, and it's just very exciting to see one unfolding in real time before your eyes. So, you know, centuries after um, the cellular structure of the other organs in the body have been understood in great detail, the cellular structure of the brain is still at the forefront of neuroscience, and that's because it's so complicated and requires very sophisticated supercomputers and instruments to study, such as this from Mark Ellisman's lab in uh, San Diego. And I want to show you what the brain tissue really looks like. So, using this new technique, we're moving into the brain, peeling away layer by layer, and you can see here's a capillary and here's, here's a nucleus and axons and dendrites. Look how dense and complex this structure is. And only 15% of it is neurons. So, you know, you have to have some respect for Ramoni Cajal and being able to try and make some sense of this structure. Now, as we zoom back, I want you to see that we're only looking at a part of the brain that's just six cells thick. So it takes supercomputers and new techniques to begin to unravel cellular structure of the brain among these cells. So shown here are waves of calcium in astrocytes in culture, where increasing levels of calcium are shown in warmer colors. These cells are communicating. And when I stimulate the neurons, and you'll see like this lightning bolt, the glial right there, the glial cells respond. Why are they doing that? How are they doing that? Well, neuroscientists quickly determined how glial cells, astrocytes, were communicating. And the first question they asked is, do they need to be touching to send calcium signals from one to the other? And in this experiment by Guthrie and Caters and others, they just scratched off the cells from a culture dish and asked, if we start a calcium wave here, can these astrocytes communicate across this cell-free gap? And you can see, just as they did, this is the result of their real experiments. And when the calcium wave reaches that gap, it jumps right across. So what that soon led to a realization is that astrocytes communicate by broadcasting signals. 
And those signals turned out to be neurotransmitters, the same neurotransmitters that neurons use to communicate. But neurons communicate like landline telephones, serially across synapses, and glia communicate like cell phones, broadcasting their signals through the brain. So this is the basic idea of, uh, of the synapse. All our ideas of information processing involve uh, release and take up of neurotransmitter from the synapse. But now we know that there are these astrocytes outside the synapse. Astrocytes have the same neurotransmitters neurons have so that they can sense neurotransmitters, but astrocytes release neurotransmitters and they take up neurotransmitters so astrocytes can control communications between neurons. But they can also pick up those signals, communicate them through a non-electric mechanism, through a non-neuronal part of the brain, through an astrocyte network to control another synapse somewhere in the brain that's not even hardwired together. Now this has also led to insights in diseases that were once thought to be neuronal, such as uh, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, because astrocytes can control uh, neurotransmission and they release cytokines and growth factors. They can control seizure activity, initiate seizure activity. Brain cancer has nothing to do with neurons except in rare cases because neurons, are mature, when they're mature, can't divide and cancer is runaway cell division. So looking at these uh, types of glial cells in, in uh, more detail, new methods to treat cancer are being developed by using drugs that target these cells. And here's one radio actively labeled that when injected into the bloodstream goes right to these tumor cells and kills them. The flip side of the ability of, neuron, of glia to divide is that they have stem cell-like properties. And you may have heard that um, the first tr human trials of transplanting stem cells into human patients just took place. Those cells are a type of glial cell called OPCs. HIV causes severe dementia and, dis and dissolution of uh, uh, neurological damage, HIV doesn't even infect neurons. It infects astrocytes and microglia. In this study, microglia, a kind of uh, cell in the brain that is the immune cell, is visualized in a mouse that's genetically engineered so that the microglia are fluorescent green. These investigators just put the mouse under the microscope to see what happened. These glial cells are moving, sensing activity, uh, and looking for damage, and when they damaged part of the brain, the glial cells descended on it. Now that could be a virus or a bacteria, or it could be an Alzheimer's plaque. So, um, and in, new research shows that uh, microglia res not only respond to, to those Alzheimer's plaques, but they may be the, uh, contributing to the cause. It's easy to understand glia involved in neurological illness, but this was more of a surprise that glia are involved in psychiatric illness. Yet. When you realize that glia act by taking up and controlling neurotransmitters, and all our drugs for treating things like depression uh, involve controlling neurotransmitters, it's very easy to understand how glia could be involved in things like depression, schizophrenia, because they're the cells in the brain regulating the take up of neurotransmitters at neurons, in addition to all the other functions that astrocytes carry out. So. Um, if we now can broaden our scope of investigation beyond the synapse, way beyond, we find a part of the brain that's scarcely been explored in terms of information processing. In the past, all ideas of learning, all ideas of memory involved synaptic transmission. What we find here is an area called white matter, and this is the output of the neurons. It's white because it's insulated with a myelin insulation, and White matter is composed of bundles of axons, billions of axons that connect neurons into circuits. The neurons are in the gray matter, and any complex cognitive function like playing the piano requires sending information through different regions of the cortex. The cells that make this insulation are glial cells called oligodendrocytes, and they can wrap, like an electrician, wrap membrane around these axons. The important point is that this increases conduction velocity 50-fold been thought of in the past to be important in disease like multiple sclerosis, but new ideas suggest it may be involved in learning, and this is coming from imaging. New methods of looking at white matter structure in detail find that differences in white matter regions associated with different cognitive and psychiatric conditions. That was never expected. Psychiatric conditions like depression and schizophrenia, developmental disorders, Cognitive function, normal range of functions, such as reading abilities, not dysfunction, 
are associated with changes in white matter regions of the brain. Now, the first thing to understand is that myelin is more than, a develop, more than a developmental process. Myelin continues after birth. So here we can see myelination of the human uh, cerebral cortex increasing uh, le levels of myelin shown with blue and purple. Myelin takes place in the first two decades after you're born and it proceeds from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. The last part of the brain to myelinate is the frontal cortex. So the reason, this has been known for a century, but the question is, why? If it's just insulation, why wasn't it done by the time you were born? IQ correlates with the uh, level of white matter structure in the brain. So as amazing as it is that you can take a snapshot of the brain and see a person's IQ, the part of the brain you're looking at doesn't have neurons and synapses in it, just axons and glia. So how could this be possible? That it, this goes back to the basic idea of learning, Pavlov's uh, rule, neurons that fire together, wire together. You've got to present the bell and the food at the same time, or those synapses are not strengthened. Neuron A and neuron B have to fire at the same time to wire together. How will that ever happen? If neuron A and neuron B are different distances apart, they won't arrive at the same time. So these conduction velocities have to be matched in every circuit. Now maybe that's done genetically, or maybe that can be controlled by function. And myelin speeds impulse conduction and may be involved in improving the synchrony and transmission of information in the brain. That would imply myelin involved in learning. In fact, studies have shown that in pianists, the uh, white matter structure increases with the number of hours they've practiced. And if you start playing the piano at age 18, only the areas of the brain that hadn't yet myelinated, the forebrain, show these changes. It's since been shown with all kinds of learning, from learning to juggle to learning uh, computer games like Tetris cause changes in white matter. Now, we don't know if these are uh, changes in myelin because this is imaging. So in my lab, we've done work on a cellular basis to ask these questions. Can glial cells sense neural activity and does this affect myelination? And again, we do this in animal models because you can't do this work in um, humans. And what we do is we grow the neurons in cell cultures that are equipped with electrodes so that we can stimulate them to fire in any pattern that we like. Then we connect these up, put them in the incubator, and at the end of that experiment, we ask, can these signals be sensed by glial cells? After all, there are no synapses, so how is that possible? And secondly, can that cause myelin to increase? And using calcium imaging here, I'll show you a result of such an experiment as you've just seen. These are neurons when we stimulate. The neurons show an increase in, white, in, in um, calcium, but these oligodendrocytes respond. All of this communication outside the neuron doctrine, no synapses, through uh, involving cells that are not neurons, and we've shown four different mechanisms by which electrical activity in axons increases myelination. So glia providing a new dimension in brain function that's not electrical. Glia can sense activity. They can control neural function. They regulate the neuronal brain involved in all kinds of uh, uh, psychiatric disorders and neurological disorders. And they are in, uh, representing a new form of learning. Now, I want to end uh, by telling you the big ideas here are that science and human activity can always overlook the obvious. And secondly, important point is that you build the brain you have by the time you're the age 20, depending upon what you did with that brain up to age 20, because our brain is regulated, develops after birth according to the environment we're in, not according to necessarily the environment of our caveman ancestors that's coded in our genes. So I want to end with this very uh, short clip from the New York Times associated with a, uh, an article written by Dan Coyle in uh, a magazine New York Times called Play, and I just have to tell you, they were interested in why you have to start young to be an excellent uh, athlete or performer, and, um, and how this new mechanism of learning may relate.
father finding himself suddenly outpaced by his teenager can relate to Doug Fields. I don't know if I can stem out that far. Despite his 30 years of climbing experience, his 15-year-old daughter Kelly gives the climbing advice and handles the tough wall with greater ease. Is it a question of physical strength? In this case, it's the effects of a neural process scientists call myelination. Okay, this is, I'm not, keep me tight. And few know this process more intimately than Doug Fields himself. Thanks to his day job as a head neuroscientist at the National Institute of Health. And his research in brain activity sheds light not only on his daughter's climbing ability, but also on how top athletes and performers develop superior skills. Well, there are a lot of factors that go into a talent like Tiger Woods. And in the past, we would have looked in the brain to find the basis of that talent, but we would have looked at neurons and synapses. And the surprise now is that with increasing talent, for example, playing the piano, there, there are changes in myelin regions of the brain. And this was never suspected in the past. Never suspected because of what myelin is, fatty membrane. Fatty material behind a perfect drive? A flawless performance of Beethoven? A successful climb to the top? The answer is found by looking at neural images. In hitting a golf ball, impulses have to be sent between neurons in the brain, and those messages are sent through communication cables called axons, as shown in red here. In order for those impulses to travel at high speed through these fibers, they need to be insulated. This is where myelin, seen here in green, comes into play, as the fatty substance wraps around and insulates the pathways. The more insulated the axons, the faster and better coordinated the messages are sent and received. <laughs> Did you stay in the stem there? <laughs> yeah, laugh. The good news is that myelin can easily be formed, and the key is repetition. Every time a specific impulse is sent, more myelin is created for those corresponding axons. In his lab, Dr. Fields tests this theory by placing neural samples from mice under repeated electrical stimulation. The result? Increased myelin. In this image, you see a lot of green, and this green is the myelin insulation. And th at this stage, it's thickly wrapped around these axons and uh, forming these tubes of insulation. And this is what's seen with increasing proficiency. In the human world, repetitive action, a.k.a. practice drills, makes perfect, or more myelin at least. There is one important factor in the myelination process working against Dr. Fields. So there's a critical period for myelination. It slows down and ends in your early 20s. Um, I've been climbing since the early 70s. Um, I started uh, when I was 17, and so myelination was largely done in my brain. But my daughters and my son started when they were kids, and uh, they benefited from that. This critical window of time is a key element to understanding highly talented people, as most will have developed their skills through repetitive action before age 20. And it also explains a more experienced father lagging behind his daughter. Jeez. It was easy, Kelly. <laughs> Let me down. You didn't think I could do that, huh? It's no problem. All right. Thank you very much.